Hello, everybody. Um, well, my name is Gustavo Silva. Uh, um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the work I have been doing for uh, more than a year now in the current community. And um, well, I've been basically fixing community issues all over the Linux kernel. But uh, recently, I've been um, involved in the kernel self-protection project. So um, I've been uh, I've been helping to remove uh, VLAs from the code base. I've been also helping to uh, to fix some um, uh, to, to to remove also well to prevent some uh, um, interior overflows during memory allocation. And uh, I also been working on um, trying to add the, the implicit fault through uh, option to the to the main make make file. So um, okay. Well, my work is supported by the Linux Foundation's Core Infrastructure Initiative. So, well, uh, this is the agenda. Well, basically, I'm going to um, explain quickly what is Coverity. Uh, I'm going to show some examples of uh, simple bug fixes, uh, just to give you an idea of what are the kind of uh, issues uh, Coverity reports. Uh, I'm also going to um, explain a little bit about my workflow. And um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my contributions, basically numbers uh, here, and um, the results of this project, and a bonus topic, which is going to be a surprise for the very, at the, at the, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so well, community is basically a statical analyzer, right? So uh, it just spits a lot of false positives. Uh, which is basically the main problem I, I have with Coverity. And, uh, and well, uh, it's, uh, it's actually the nature of uh, every static code analyzer, right? Uh, we are always going to have a lot of false positives. And um, uh, we have to spend, well, sometimes waste a lot of time like trying to, to spot which is an actual bug, which is an actual issue, and, uh, and discard the rest, right? So. Um, uh, well, Coverity uh, distinguishes between two uh, major sets of issues, and one of them is the high impact issues. Uh, in this set of issues, uh, these are three of the categories um, that Coverity um, reports. Um, the first one, uh, memory and illegal accesses. Well, this is basically an out of bounds access. Uh, resource leaks is uh, memory leaks, right? and uninitialized variables. And the other set is the median impact issues. Um, in this set, uh, falls, um, into this set falls uh, the, null, the null point of the references, which is, uh, it can be either before or after a null check, and, uh, and of course, if, uh, if there is an explicit null the reference, uh, this also is included, right? Uh, Interior handling issues, which is basically a bad bit shift operation and API usage errors, which is basically if you are calling a, a function, but you are not uh, passing the, the arguments in the right order, right? And control flow issues. Okay, um, this is the ugliest slide I have, I guess. Uh, uh, this is merely to, to give you an idea of what uh, uh, the Kubernetes interface looks like, right? I'm not going to walk you through uh, the details about the interface. Uh, if you uh, follow this link after the talk, um, you are, uh, this link is going to take you to the list of projects that uh, are related to the Linux kernel and that Coverity uh, is helping to, to report issues uh, for, for all of them. And, um, and well, this is uh, how the interface looks like. In the, um, in the right side, you can see um, a list of categories of issues. Um, at the bottom, well, you can see actually the, the, the code that is being analyzed. And um, this is basically reporting uh, the reference before a null check. So um, that's, that's, the inter that's the interface, right? So, okay, now I'm going to um, show you some, some bug fixes and uh, I'm going to, to, to try to explain you uh, a little bit about them. And uh, well, the first one here is, uh, is very, very simple. It's a fixed type of variable. Um, here, uh, this, is, this is the patch uh, with the fix. 
uh, original, this uh, variable counter was subtype uh, oxygenate int of uh, eight bits, right? So um, this is the original code. So if you see uh, the original code in the, in the part below, uh, the developer changed this constant from, from 10 to 1,000. So the issue here is that, uh, well, uh, previously our variable was of type of signed in of eight bits, but now uh, we are expecting to, uh, to, to pass uh, the value of 255, right? So now this type of variable is not enough. So we need only to change the, the type, we need to, ex to extend the, uh, the range of the variables, of the, of the values, of the integer values or variable can hold. So that was a, a, an easy fix. Um, this, um, this, this type of issues is, is, uh, is very common, actually. Um, Coverity report this kind of issues as a copy-paste error. And um, there is also a coccinal script and uh, you can spot a lot of, well, not a lot, but you can spot every now and then uh, some of these issues, right? So the problem here is that uh, when we use the is error and a pointer error macro, uh, well, we have to use the same pointer, right? So the problem here is that um, uh, we, were, we were using a, a different one, another pointer. So that was a simple fix. And yeah, this is the original code. Um, this is another example of um, here what Coverity reports is a logical and, uh, and a structurally dead code. This is the fix, and uh, this is the original code. Here, uh, if you notice, we have a, a for loop that is supposed to, to run twice, right? Uh, the problem is that um, we have a return here, and, um, and well, this loop is only going to, to run uh, um, one time, right? So uh, what I had to do here is, uh, well, I, I wasn't quite sure about the, 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 the right fix. So, well, I just contacted the maintainer. Uh, he, he replied, he replied with a, with a nice, uh, in a nice manner. So, so yeah, the right fix was only checking. We, we had to check this uh, return, return value, right? And, and that, was, that was the fix. And, um, okay, this is uh, an infinite loop and an out-of-bounds access at the same time. So here the problem, you see the original code. Uh, well, here in this piece of code, we don't appreciate uh, the part of uh, uh, the, the block code where these variables are being declared, uh, variable i and variable slot id, but they are original of type uh, signed integer. So, uh, so yeah. And then we are using E uh, as an index uh, for, the, for the net info buffer, right? So, so yeah, the, the issue was obvious there, so we only had to increment uh, the variable uh, i instead of decrementing it, right? Um, okay, These are, um, this is one of the issues that, this, I consider this is a, a beautiful issue because um, the problem here is that if you see the original code, uh, we have a cast, right? We are casting a whole expression. Um, each one of these operands is, uh, is, is a type integer of 32 bits. So apparently the, the developer, the original developer, uh, thought uh, that this expression could uh, overflow uh, into more than 32 bits, right? So he said, well, he just added a cast in to 64 bits, and that was the, the solution uh, for him at that time. The problem is that this cast is applied only after the compiler, uh, um, only after the, the expression um, is evaluated. So in this case, if all the operands are of uh, size 32 bit, the whole expression is going to, to, to be, uh, the result is going to be in, two, in 32 bits. So we are losing bits in case this expression overflows, right? So the solution here is remove the, the, the parentheses 
and just add the cast to any of the operands. And by doing, by doing this, uh, by doing so, um, the arithmetic is going to, um, the expression is going to be evaluated in a 64-bit arithmetic. So it's the same case for um, uh, below. And um, okay, this is another uh, dangerous issue. Uh, here, well, um, originally we the, the developer was freeing the uh, the variable rule, right? And after that, he was uh, he was the, re the referencing in it. So um, the solution here was simple. Just we need to add uh, a new variable uh, to store the value of, uh, of PTR error of this macro before freeing uh, the variable rule. So that was the solution. Um, and this one, well, um, uh, at, the, at the beginning of, the, of this presentation, I, I mentioned that um, I am, for quite a while, I've been sending patches to uh, either add annotations, add, add info through annotations, uh, for switch cases uh, where we are intentionally falling through the next case um, or, uh, well, trying to um, realize, trying to identify if I am dealing with an actual issue and the problem is a missing break or a missing return or a missing continuum. And I have found all of those cases. So uh, here what I found is that, uh, well, there was a missing return. So um, the solution was, was that. And um, well, uh, now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about my workflow. Uh, well, obviously I am uh, reading, I am reviewing uh, uh, daily reports, uh, daily community reports, right? Trying to, uh, to see uh, if there are new issues introduced uh, to the code base, right? And well, I am regularly uh, using a smatch. I am using a smatch basically to, uh, to spot spectre issues, uh, variant one, because uh, Dan Carpenter did a great job uh, by adding this feature to, to the smatch tool. Uh, Coverity also, the, the Coverity guys, they also added this, they added a rule to, uh, to identify this kind of issues, but uh, based on my experience, uh, as much is, uh, is much better uh, in this case. Um, well, I am also, I'm using, I use Coxinet a lot. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's an amazing tool. I personally consider that every C developer out there uh, should know, should learn a little bit about Coxinet. And, um, and well, of course, uh, every kernel developer too. Uh, so I've been using a lot of Coxinel. So uh, there, are, there are days in which uh, actually um, I, I don't spot any, any issue uh, or Kubernetes doesn't report any issue. So in those days, I, I usually uh, write Coxinel scripts to, uh, to identify some patterns. And uh, okay, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> this, this is a funny story. Um, I'm not an early person, but uh, recently I had to start waking up uh, between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. I am usually in a time zone. The time, my time zone is UTC minus five. But the thing, the thing here is that um, the last year when I when I was here and I was um, giving a presentation similar to this one, um, I was um, I was getting community reports every week. Uh, but now, from a, I don't quite remember, it's been quite a while now, that there is someone from Canonical, I guess he's Colin Ian King is his name. Uh, he's now uh, running this Coverity tool, and, um, and now we are getting daily Coverity reports. So the thing is that at some point, we started, we started kind of a, a race of a competition, which was actually very... Uh, uh, very productive for me because that forced me to uh, to improve my skills actually. So so I I knew that between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. Uh, we were getting a new a new daily report, 
And between those hours, he was not actually uh, there in the computer and, 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 and fixing these issues, right? So I was there, and I was getting the new issues, and I was uh, uh, sending more patches and fixing more, more, more issues, right? But um, it is, it's actually, this is something uh, that I consider very, very good for me. Uh, well, I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, contributions. Um, the last year, um, when I when I when I was given uh, this presentation, the last year I had uh, about four months working on this project. So at that time, I already had uh, uh, I already have contributed uh, a little bit more than two hundred patches. Uh, now, uh, well, it's uh, a little bit more than seven hundred and fifty. Um, again, this not only includes uh, community fixes, this also includes um, uh, cleanups, um, this also includes um, uh, the removal of a lot of VLAs. Um, I've, been, I've been working uh, very close to case, so um, as I'm getting involved in the, in the current cell protection project, every now and then he, uh, he has a, a task for me, right? So, and, um, and well, this accounts, this number accounts for, for the total of, of that work. Um, oh yeah, well, I was telling you that I, I am also working on this. Um, okay, uh, from the total amount of my contributions, of the contributions th thanks to this project, uh, 274 are annotations, are full through annotation, annotations. So this uh, roughly accounts for 30% of all the work I have been doing so far. And, um, and well, Coxina, uh, happy 10th anniversary, where is ah, it's Julia? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been using Coxina a lot, and actually um, I encourage people that uh, use Coxina to, uh, to explicitly add to the commit log that you are using Coxina, right? So this is, uh, I consider this important for two reasons. One of them is uh, to, so we can get metrics, right? We can know exactly, or if not exactly, we can have a, an approximate of how many, how many patches um, have been applied to the, to the Opsin kernel uh, thanks to, to the development of this tool. And the other reason, of course, um, is to give credit to, to the people behind, behind this tool because uh, whenever you send a, a question to the Coxin and mailing list, uh, Julia replies in a matter of minutes, so I think it's important to, uh, to, to be grateful for that, right? And, um, okay, so the total number of the contributions, uh, 222, uh, is uh, thanks to, to Coxina, right? And, um, yeah, this is, uh, again, this is roughly 30% uh, of uh, all the work I, I have been doing. Again, um, this number, when I, when I use Coxina scripts, uh, can be for uh, for cleanups, or can also be to identif identify certain pattern that is uh, actually uh, uh, an actual bug, right? That can be considered an actual bug. Okay, the results of this project so far. Okay, these are um, categories of, of bugs that uh, Covetti reports. Uh, well, actually, classification and miscellaneous is not a, a covetic category. But, uh, well, well um, thanks to this project, um, I have managed to fix issues uh, that fall into uh, more than 10 of these categories. Um, now, again, um, these types, every category has uh, certain types of issues, right? And, um, and well, in uh, part of these types of, of, of issues, I, I added uh, the variable length arrays, the removal of the variable length arrays, uh, the fix of expected uh, v1, the expected variant one vulnerability, and, um, and well, all of these types of issues, um, thanks to this project, I have been managed to fix uh, a lot of these types of issues uh, all over the, the Linux kernel, and well. This work uh, has an impact on more than 38 uh, subsystem and components so far. And uh, yeah, 
I have also uh, contributed code, contributed bug fixes to uh, 14 stable uh, trees. And the star here at the 4.14 um, stable kernel uh, means that um, I started doing I started doing this work uh, during the development cycle of this of this kernel. And um, okay, the bonus. Okay, I cannot let pass the opportunity to talk a little bit about COC. Uh, my experience with COC. Okay, um, this information is extracted from patchwork. So Patchwork says that uh, I've been, I have sent more than 1,000 patches. Um, but it's actually not true. Uh, those more than, one how, more than 100, 1,000 patches that uh, uh, Patchwork reports are both patches and also questions, or as I call them, interactions in general, right? Interactions with, with, uh, with kernel maintainers. OK. now. Out of those more than 1,000 interactions, three of them stand out. OK, the first one. Uh, well, this, this was a comment from one maintainer, a very senior maintainer, to one of uh, my patches. Um, the second one. OK, this was uh, a comment from another senior. I don't know if this guy is a maintainer, but this is a, a very well-known and very uh, in, in a respected guy in the current community. Um, I was proposing something. And he replies saying, well, I hate when, and so and so. And the third one, I like more the third one, because uh, this guy didn't use, let's say, an unprofessional expression or, or an unprofessional word. He was more sophisticated, so he used uh, the deference in, in the whole email, right? So that's kind of funny. Um, OK, so if you take into account that uh, I have had uh, one exactly 1,126 uh, interactions with the kernel maintainers, and only three of them uh, replied in a, let's say, unprofessional way. Uh, this accounts for 0.27% uh, of all the interactions I have had in the, in the kernel community, which is a pretty good uh, percentage, I guess. So, um, so based on these numbers, I can say that it's been 99.73% of a pleasure to be working in this community. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, just, a, just a last comment. Before the, before the question, just a last comment uh, uh, here. Why I am, I am commenting about this? Um, well. Due to the nature of the work I have been doing in the current community, well, I get to interact with a lot of people. Uh, so I'm not working on a, on a particular subsystem or a particular component. So uh, I, by, no, by no means, I am initiating a persecution against someone. I just think it is important to have uh, this perspective because um, I have been working now for 16 months as a kind of developer, and I think um, the numbers are, are, are really good. I mean, uh, to me, I, I have not had any problem, right? So uh, this is just for you to know my perspective as someone who gets to interact with a lot of people during this amount of time. And, um, so questions? So, thank you for your yeah. Just one thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your enthusiasm for Coxinell. So what I was wondering is, um, so it seems like in your first four months you did 400 patches, and they, were they mostly Coverity inspired? 200, more than 200. Two, 200. Uh, yeah. They yeah. were mostly Coverity. Yeah, mostly Coverity. And in the last year you've done 550 more patches, but you've worked on a bunch of other things also. So I wonder if... Coverity is somehow keeping up with the kernel, or is it kind of slowing down in its usefulness? Oh uh, no! Or, well, the 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 thing is, um, it spits a lot of false positives, and uh, sometimes um, it doesn't even report uh, an issue uh, for two days or three days, and. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it's because of the nature of the development. That usually happens during the merge window. So 
uh, that's when I actually during the merge window is when I managed to to do a lot of coccinal work. Yeah. But I wonder is um, like your work and Colin's work are you somehow stamping out all the bugs that Coverity detects, and so we've kind of moved on from that? Do you think is it possible? Oh. Are there some classes of bugs that are just not happening anymore? They're just gone. I haven't detected a bug that has stopped. I mean that. Uh, I guess that's why the kernel cell protection project uh, came to life, trying to do something like that. And uh, but now from Coverity, I still getting the same the same kind of the same type of issues I was seeing at the very beginning. I, I still I still seeing them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so what is it about using the size of asterisk stuff in kmalloc? Why is that a problem? You had it like four slides uh, before. Which yep. Um, next, 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 next. Next, yeah, this one. And it's, yeah, that one. What is that about? Use size bar. Oh, yeah, well, it's, it's, this is basically. Um, it's basically a matter of a style. It prevents, as, as the code evolves, it prevents that if uh, you change the, the files in the structure, it prevents you from, uh, from not allocating the right uh, amount of, uh, of memory. Yeah, hold on. So this is actually the recommended practice. This is not a bug. Yeah, no, it's Oh, not, okay, it's I see. Yeah, yeah it's, it, gotcha. that's why I say it's more about the style. Yeah, I, I was wondering if uh, what you're recommend, recommending is use size of structure instead. No, no, no. Yeah, good. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Uh, a lot of examples you showed us, like actually code by recent compilers. How do you think the bug were not code before? Like, are we not using re recent compiler enough, or not the proper compiler flag, or something? Uh, the question is why I'm getting a lot of, of issues. Uh, no, but, but like for example, uh, when there is overflow, recent compiler tells us now, and a lot of small mistakes that you showed us, when you use recent compilers with decent compile flag option, so it will prevent your code to compile. And th but anyway, this code ends up in Linux anyway, and you get to fix it, right? So how does this come? Like, where does this come then? Are we not using recent compiler or not using the, the right compiler flags? Okay. I don't know if I make myself clear. I, I'm not sure about the question. What you're asking is you want the build to break on error when the compiler detects a problem. And the issue is that nobody can agree on the set of warning flags that it would break on error for the compiler to detect a problem. I mean, there was the uh, the the ten thousand, uh, which was converted from ten, and if they forgot to change the type, this makes a warning uh, even on old compilers. So that means we have, even in staging, we have code which compiles with warnings. Yeah, it should it should trigger a, a warning, Those right? Those kind of warnings. Yeah, but actually, well, nobody compiled before integrating. That's what what it means. Oh, maybe. Yeah, but that's well, that's actually uh, the responsibility of the developer, right, to compile his code. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but I, guess, I guess what he's saying, because this issue is, it's got to be pretty obvious that something is wrong, right? I mean, if you compile your code, you've got to see a warning, because the, the, the value you are using to compare uh, your variable against uh, is bigger than the maximum no, range no. of your type. The, the problem is, the problem, the, the reason we don't build the kernel with the W error to break on build is because GCC periodically, and it's in a very large project, it, it just, it's too big. We get a number of false positives. So the build would break on false positives every time. And for a while, we took to annotating the false positives, but they seem to change with every version of GCC. So eventually, we just gave up trying to make GCC completely happy and accepted that some warnings that certain versions of the compiler produce are false positives, and we don't break the build because of it. That's the issue.
the three examples you showed, one was giving a clear warning which was not a false positive, and the other two weren't even working. So I, I remember only three, and uh, so that means uh, the guy who, com who asked for integration, he did not check warnings, the integrator did not check warnings, and the other two, the guy did not even try what he was committing. No, yeah, I agree why, with you. Why, why do we, have, and, and only one of them was, uh, one of them was not in staging, I, I mean, uh, yeah. why is this code in the kernel? Why, does it, why do we need uh, uh, the big army of coverage to find those kind of things? Yeah, and it's, it's not that uncommon, huh? <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not that uncommon. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. When I was, uh, I, I recently did not do a lot of contributions. I basically stopped five years ago. But at my times, there were other problems, but this kind of stuff never would have gotten into the kernel. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But we were at 5 million lines of code. Now we are at 16 million lines of code. Okay, tomorrow we'll be at 20 million, but 4 million lines like that, I don't know. But, but Patrick, so, where, sometimes where's my, so, where's some my warnings problem? are introduced with new, vers uh, new no, no, versions no, of GCC. No, no, th those kind of stuff, no. No, no but... Uh, no, I'm so talking specifically about... Yeah, that, about I guess that's in, in debatable, yeah. <laughs> is there, uh, so my <laughs> question is, is the quality of, uh, no, no. of, of source code uh, lowering? I, I, I feel censored. <laughs> so. <laughs> so is the quality getting lower in the kernel code? And overall, or is it just the examples you are shown and I am completely biased by these examples? Please answer my question, <laughs> if possible. She's fixing it, so it's not getting long. Yes. Yeah, but those kind of stuff did not exist before, and this quantity, I, I, at least it's my feeling. But it's even worse. The, the problem is that the, the developer didn't build it. The maintainer ignored the results from the zero test builder because this is built by the uh, uh, zero day, and it will be built. Uh, what I'm seeing a pattern recently is companies, they send patches with seven signed off with colleagues from their work. And it's difficult for a maintainer from the same company to say no to a patch which has seven signed off by. And uh, maybe we should put some stop to that, but maybe this is not the right presentation to talk about these things. Perhaps that person should not be a maintainer then. Uh, I have a completely different question. <laughs> um, do you know among uh, all these uh, 1,000 uh, fixes uh, you, you wrote, uh, the number of bugs which were in fact introduced as a, a fix for another bug? As a consequence of as a consequence uh, of fixes? Of fix. mm. Um, hmm. I, I'm very um, I'm very curious about the same thing, of course, because it's my work. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember I have introduced a bug. No, no, not those that you introduce. But for example, you see an overflow, an integral overflow on a counter. Maybe it was just a fix for a timeout with, which was too short. The developer significantly increased it and did not realize that, in fact, it uh, overflows uh, the type, you see. Um, in fact, it happens, uh, at least to me, in other projects like HF Proxy, to sometimes fix a bug. And you are so much focused on a bug when you have worked one week on it mm -hmm. that you completely uh, overlook some consequences of it. And uh, I yeah. think it is interesting to figure if certain fixes uh, need to cook a little more before being backported. That's, that's very common, but when people introduce new memory allocations, uh, usually, and, that, and that's very common, uh, I, have seen many, I have seen many cases in which uh, the developer adds a new memory allocation and immediately is checking if the allocation uh, actually was successful. Uh, otherwise, he's returning immediately, but he's not taking into account a previous allocation. That's very common. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's very common. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I would like to go back to the false positives. I have the luck to work on a project where coverity gives no false positives. Really? Uh, the last one. I, I think I've seen one in the last year. Wow. Um, the solution to that is assertions. 
uh, once you have assertions, you reduce the, um, the graph of the static analysis, and it removes a lot of cases that cannot happen. But if you do not tell coverity that this is, for example, a variable that has a value between this and that at this point, um, this variable cannot be null, things like that, if you don't tell it, it will try every branches. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's a big issue, actually, to do that, because uh, hmm, we need another person to do that. I mean, <laughs> someone that, that knows uh, the code and, uh, and that has the time to do that, right? So if you want to get rid of false positives, it's very hard because you have to follow the um, sequence mm -hmm. and find the branches that don't make sense. And you have to know that they don't make sense, and then you can stick and assert. Yeah, so uh, a very common uh, false positive is uh, when, when we are passing uh, the address of the, of the variable that is being initialized inside this function uh, to which we are passing it. And uh, yeah, Covetti reports that uh, we are using an uninitialized unitial, un variable when, so, when, yeah. when, the, when the variable is actually being initialized inside this function, right? Yeah, but you can work around that uh, by setting the variable to null before you pass it um, as a reference. Yeah, but yeah, that, that um, requires well, that requires a lot of instrumentation, right? Yeah, as you say, adding assertions. Yeah. Yeah. So just to comment on that solution about setting things to null, I mean, it doesn't seem really like, I mean, it's okay, so now your variable is initialized, but it's initialized to a meaningless value, and now you have just uh, hidden the potential warning, so. Yeah, actually, uh, actually I mean, that. It's kind of a trade-off. Of course, it's a, a um, it, now it's initialized, so it's not going to contain secrets anymore, so it's, there's the security problem is gone, but there's still, you can have problems with the code crashing, so. It's not necessarily a good idea always just to hide um, hide warnings just by somehow artificially making them disappear. Yeah, so something related to that that I was trying at the very beginning of this project is uh, using coxinal scripts uh, to spot instead of uh, identify issues to identify uh, false positives and then compare the results uh, of uh, the, the Kuwaiti report against the, the output of these uh, scripts and just ignore the matches. But yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, I'd like to reply to what uh, James said uh, with regards to warnings. Uh, it's not necessarily one size fits all. You, you don't necessarily have to err on all warnings or uh, on all uh, GCC versions. What, what you can do is uh, select a few warnings which you know uh, compile and uh, have uh, only this uh, defined, predefined set uh, error on uh, error. And uh, I've heard of uh, a few people doing that uh, with success. And as the code matures, they, had, they add more warnings. And uh, they even, you can even manage it differently per subtree. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's possible to, to have uh, error, war um, error on warnings uh, a bit by bit and not necessarily uh, all, all warnings uh, which would necessarily break uh, on new versions of the compiler. Well, I, for small projects I agree. So if you look at all, the, all my projects on uh, kernel.org that aren't the kernel, I do compile with W error. The problem with the kernel is that we've never actually found the set of flags that we can successfully do that doesn't end up annoying some maintainer because a false positive breaks, one false positive breaking the build equals one maintainer annoyed, <laughs> and the quickest way of fixing it is just to turn off W error. So we have had the odd occasion where people have tried to turn it on. We get several breaks, we get several annoyed maintainers, we have a fractious few days, and then eventually the solution is just to turn it off again. That's, uh, uh, that's, that's what I'm saying. If, if a maintainer has issues with a few warnings, he can disable them, but only in his subtree. You don't have to have the same set of warnings for the whole kernel. Well, the make, with make, we can, can't remove flags, we can add them. So if each subsystem wants to add W error, we could do that, but we can't add it at the top and then say to a maintainer, it breaks, oh, you can just remove the flag because you can't. You, you can. You can, yeah. 
I think. You can do dash w no dash error, so this will disable um, the errors. As long as is uh, as uh, this flag is appearing after the w error, you can disable it this way. Of course, it complicates the command lines, but it's doable. Well, he can propose the patch and see what happens. <laughs> um. Actually, I, I would like to comment on, on what James said. Uh, I believe with the uh, K build, it is possible to filter out the C flags. So you can just filter out the uh, V error in the make files, I believe. Yes. You can also turn off errors for specific warnings as well. So dash w no error equals something, I think. But have we actually tried turning on dash w error since we had Pengwang's zero day built? No. They might help. Zero day is a better form of fixing it. Every time we turn w error on, we've still only Is it feasible to someday just increase the minimum compiler version to GCC 8.2, and then a lot of these problems just go away, and we have better code generation, and we the, the force the tool the other chain way vendors to No, the, the problem is up. the other way around. It's not, it's, not the, it's not the minimum compiler version, it's the maximum compiler version. It's every time you get a new compiler, and a lot of people use the kernel to verify the, whether the compiler actually produces the correct code and use very new compilers on the kernel. Um, you would end up fixing a couple new hundred new warnings for every compiler version that comes up, and you put all the burden on the people that do want to run new compilers. So that's, that's the other downside of it. This sounds good, though, if there are one, extra one thing, warnings people need to fix because our compilers are fine, and that seems like... I, I agree, but the question is who is actually going to sign up to, do, to fix all of these things? Do you want to distribute that across a, a broader audience, or do you want to have that single soul that just happens to run your compiler, the new compiler, be the one that fixes all of them up? As a distro, we usually just tell the toolchain people to do all that. I mean, I'm, I'm happy, but uh, I'm pretty sure whoever actually develops GCC 9 right now is not very happy about that part. Um, I had one more point, but I forgot that one right now. Oh. Yes, and one more point, uh, and I don't want to break the mood, but uh, one issue is not that you have more and more warnings uh, if you upgrade your GCC uh, version, but existing uh, warnings get smarter or get regression, and uh, a code that was bidding fine with a specific warning, maybe you upgrade your GCC version, it's not bidding anymore. And uh, there are a lot of cases like uh, uninitialized uh, path detection, which are sometimes a bit flaky depending on the release. So unfortunately, even that, it's, it's complicated. And it can depend on the architecture as well. For example, you have some architectures with unsigned uh, cars and uh, others with signed cars, and it uh, completely changes uh, some uh, warnings from time to time. The, the other problem with this is that some of the warnings, like uninitialized variable, we actually want to see because zero day uses them. It will tell you if we get a new uninitialized warning variable, then you go and check. And if it's a real problem, you fix it. But if it's, a, if it's not a real problem, you just add it to the zero day patterns and it will just ignore it, which is actually a better way of coping with the errors than if we broke the builds on uninitialized variables, then we'd have to add all of these null initializers or all the other crap that Julia warned you you would just start hiding errors. So we know that with particular versions of GCC, we can see this. And fortunately, zero day seems to be clever enough to have a, a sort of uh, these expected warnings for every different version of GCC. So it's actually a fairly good way of um, telling us whether we have a real problem or not, and remembering when the real problem is actually a false positive. I remember my point again. <laughs> um, so one thing that we did in QMU is that we actually change W error depending on whether it's a release or not. So we basically say we enable W error during the development phase. So all the developers do get caught in uh, error checks. And if there is an uninitialized variable, well, worst case, what you have to do is just annotate them, right? That's, that's the worst thing that, should, that can happen. And you can easily do that within C. Um, 
Whereas in a release, you don't want to burden all of your users and, and, and end users that will build it with all the random weird configurations that you maybe just didn't test uh, with new warnings that would eventually break the build, even though it really doesn't actually care the compiler is smart enough to fix up that warning on its own. Um, or to not care um, or fi find a random code path that just happens to work. So in, in that case, you want to not have a W error at all. Uh, yeah, but it's still a pain in the ass when new compiler versions come up. And it so is. I agree. <laughs> I mean, uh, and also QMO is like a few order of magnitude smaller than uh, than the kernel. Like, and and the kernel has a few order of magnitude order of more magnitudes. developers, um, so it yeah, distributes better. Yeah. So, uh, like, fifty more, fifty times the people that get annoyed. <laughs> like if one person gets annoyed, it's not a big deal. If 50 people start complaining, it's good, noisier. Good point. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.